Dr. Phil George is going to uh, address global sourcing of beef genetics to meet a vertically coordinated breeding objective. Um, for those of you that, uh, that don't know Phil, I think um, maybe one of the most successful former academics that I know. Um, Phil's uh, got a really uh, unique background, uh, a Kansas uh, uh, native, uh, bachelor's and master's degree in animal science from K-State, go cats, um, and a PhD in animal nutrition uh, at Cornell University. Um, Phil started his uh, a career uh, as an assistant professor animal science at the University of Illinois um, in a cow-calf research and teaching uh, beef production uh, course um, there at Illinois. One of the interesting tidbits is that uh, John Beaver, who's a, a renowned uh, animal genomics uh, and geneticist uh, now at the University of Tennessee, uh, formerly at U of I, um, was Phil's first graduate student. Um, and he worked on a, a master's project in 1986 that was the first to investigate the relationship between DNA markers and cattle performance. Um, and that data uh, for that project was collected at Gardner Angus Ranch um, in Southwest uh, Kansas. Uh, so a really uh, unique connection there. Um, following uh, his stint at the uh, University of Illinois, um, Phil served as a general manager for Cross Mountain Ranch in Craig, Colorado. Uh, he oversaw about 400,000 acres that ranged in elevation from 5,000 to 11,000 feet, um, operated about 1,200 cows, uh, 1,500 yearlings, 8,000 ewes, um, uh, harvested uh, about 300 coyotes a year, and filled 116 bull elk tags. So a, a really uh, unique opportunity there in, uh, in the production system uh, in the Intermountain West. Uh, following that, he served as general manager at Rollins Ranch in Okeechobee, Florida. Um, that operation spanned 50,000 acres, um, varied in elevation. I thought this was interesting, from 16 to 42 feet. <laughs> and uh, ran about 8,500 cows and harvested about 40, 440 alligators a year. Um, following that, uh, he's worked uh, as the uh, manager at Pine Valley Ranch, Halfway, Oregon, um, another very large operation, about 130,000 acres, um, range in elevation from a couple thousand to 7,500 feet. Um, and that's a, a really rugged operation. I've seen pictures of that place. Um, it ran about 1,200 cows. Um, at, at that location. Um, so a, a unique background in, in really extensive management systems. Um, and following that um, um, set of experiences, um, took on a role um, as production director of beef and lamb operations uh, with Miratorg Agribusiness Holdings um, based in Moscow, Russia uh, since 2011. Um, and so Phil was one of the uh, gentlemen that was responsible for sourcing, well, I won't give too, too much of your story away, a lot of genetics from the US and Australia uh, to export as live animals um, to this project. And, and that's, I know parts of your family and that's the way we first met. So I've really enjoyed that relationship. Uh, he and his wife, Lena, uh, currently reside uh, at their family's ranch in Kansas um, near Lebo. Um, that's been in their family for 152 years. So please help me welcome Dr. Phil George. Bob, thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Uh, to start with, I uh, need to get rid of my thank yous. Start off with my wife, Lena. Many people have asked uh, where she is. Well, uh, you guys have got a labor problem. You just married the wrong woman. Uh, she's home bring it, breeding cows right now. So uh, I'm all well taken care of. And uh, also my brother, Vern, he's very instrumental in the uh, project that we carried on for the last 11 years. I started with uh, Meritorg 11 years ago, a uh, company owned by identical twin brothers born and raised in Moscow, trained as engineers, first vice presidents of physicists. Uh, they started the company 20, uh, about 27 years ago, 1995, when they were about 25 years old. Uh, they began importing whey from Poland. Food was scarce. Uh, so they set up in, importing whey from Poland, distribution network, later added pork and poultry. So they kind of did it completely opposite of most of us. They started actually in the food business, importation, distribution, and gradually added product value to those imported goods, repackaging, and later got into pork production in about 
2005. And subsequently, then they started the beef project, the, the broiler project, and uh, also the, the uh, land project. We have a large agronomic division as well. Uh, these guys are one of the most driven and ambitious guys I've ever been around. Uh, a lot of times I've had questions, well, is this Putin's project? Uh, I think Putin has been on the project, visit the pork project, but uh, I don't know he's been there otherwise. And I don't think the money, uh, although the money doesn't come from them, they're, they're capitalists. Uh, the battles that they've faced over the last uh, 25 years of their business, nobody would endure what they've done uh, if it wasn't their own money or their own company. So uh, really very, very driven guys. And one thing I point out is, and I think we could all learn from them, is uh, everything's extremely quantitative. Again, physicists and engineers. And so when they want an answer, they want a number. They want a number and they want a time. And they want somebody responsible for that. And uh, so I think that that's, that's something that we deal with every day in, our, in, in running our business. This motto, we feed people, is a company motto, has a uh, much deeper meaning in Russia because there's been some very hard times without food in Russia. We're completely vertically integrated, versatile in, in pork, broilers, lamb, beef cattle, uh, and also on a rosé veal. It's not really vertically integrated because we actually get the dairy calves from outside sources. And we also have a Wagyu Angus project, currently producing 8 million pigs a year, about 50, somewhere 55 to 60 million uh, broilers a year, 12,000 broilers an hour. Uh, the Pride Lamb project is kind of an embassy. We've got uh, between 50 and 75,000 ewes in production, completely uh, accelerated lamb program, uh, completely confined operation. And so the ewes actually lamb every eight months and are, uh, we're setting up the a breeding strategy by which we, the same as our pork strategy where we actually cross uh, two maternal lines to produce the F1 that becomes the base of our ewe flock. And then we made it to a uh, terminal line. Uh, so this is, this is on track to be about 500,000 ewes in 2028 and producing 1.5 million lambs a year. We also have other operations behind these cattle operations. You end up having an additional opportunity and additional um, uh, purpose. Uh, we have our own byproduct rendering plant. We have a hide processing and tannery that uh, completes the uh, hides to a wet blue stage. We have our own pet food plant to use like some of them byproducts. We have our own grass and alfalfa seed production facility. Sausage and cured meats plant. We have our own premix and supplement plant. Fresh vegetable and process, uh, production processing plant because see we're also in retail. And we have our own construction company because we're always building something. We manufacture our own concrete blunks. We actually even manufacture our own barbed wire. So for at least some of these, we, we have PIC pigs and we actually cooperate with PIC to actually do some of the development of the, of the breeding stock there. Uh, of course, we buy the breeding stock for the broilers, but we control all the genetics in the beef project and also the lamb project. Uh, we're in the animal production, feed production, large agronomic division. Um, we do processing as well. We have two pork plants, one beef plant. The lambs are currently processed at the beef plant. And uh, of course, we have the poultry plant. Um, later, there will be a lamb plant that will be constructed as well. Large distribution uh, division, and we're also in retail. We have about... Uh, 150 retail stores throughout Western cities in Russia. And uh, uh, also uh, there's about 20 burger restaurants in, uh, in Moscow. And then we've got one kind of flagship restaurant in Moscow as well, uh, serving products. Our targets are really high, I say high quality beef. It's really high quality meat. Uh, it's gonna be safe, pure, minimal pharmaceuticals, traceable, consistent, predictable, profitable, reasonably priced as well. We need a diversity of products, diversity of customers, 
and diversity of price brands in all, uh, on all species. Currently, we control about 3 million acres. Uh, when I arrived there in, in two, 2011, in January, uh, we owned maybe 30, 30 to 50,000 acres. We were buying 2,500 acres a week, uh, which seemed like a lot to me. Uh, we had no fences, no water systems, no crails, no nothing. And by the time we uh, got our first shipments in June 2nd of that year, so we, we couldn't start any construction until April 15th because of all the snow. So we actually, uh, they, we, we, do, we do things very quickly and amazingly. Uh, later, we were uh, growing quite rapidly because it's kind of a pyramid scheme. And one thing you learn when you work for, at least for this company, they don't know anything, an increase of 10%, 20%, 30%. The only thing they know is double. We're going to double. Project was first projected to 50,000 cows. We got, I don't know, we got to 20,000. Well, we're doubling. We're going to 100. Then we got somewhere up around 80,000 cows. And all of a sudden, we're spread. Well, we're going to double it. We're going to 200,000. And then it wasn't long, you know, we get up towards that. Well, we're going to double again. Well, we're now at 360,000 cows. I haven't heard the uh, doubling word mentioned just yet, but uh, I don't know. Maybe it's coming. But about 500,000 acres in corn production, either silage, high moisture corn, dry corn, that's equivalent to about 75 million bushels. That's a lot, I mean, from my perspective. 250,000 acres of soybean production. We have our own soybean processing facility. 250,000 acres of wheat, triticale, and barley. A lot of that's actually used in uh, pork and poultry diets. Uh, cattle production, we now have 100 farms. There's 3,500 to 4,500 cows on every farm. Uh, 50, uh, 50 backgrounding or heifer development farms. Uh, we've got one seed stock farm. Three, thought, three feed lots with about 225,000 head capacity. Then we got one beef plant that kills 100 animals an hour, about 10,000 a week, or has the potential to do 500,000 a year. There's probably 25 or 20,000 miles of barbed wire fence and 250 miles of feed bunks in our project because we feed the cows in feed bunks and they're fed about six months out of the year from Oh, well, sometimes late November all the way till oh, sometime in middle of April, first uh, of May. This is a, a picture of a typical farm layout. And once you've seen one, you've seen it all. I designed kind of the crail system. You've got the main crail building, main crail setup. Uh, you have a, uh, this is just a Google Earth shot for, uh, of the Braille layout, you can actually bring 600 pairs into that uh, setup. It's got diagonal pins that feed the alley that goes into a bud box design. Uh, silence a shoot in front of the, uh, there's a double alley and then single alley and the uh, silence to shoot setup. You can put 18 cows in that, uh, in the bud box and feed right into that alley system. So if you wanna do a mass medication, you can move a lot of cows through there in a, in a big hurry. Uh, there's usually one or two houses built on every farm. We've also got a stable there, uh, a facility for commodity, um, all like Sunfire Cake or, or Brewer's Grain Delivery and our pre-mixed deliveries. And then we've got a small shop area. This is just some of the photos of, of some of the uh, some of the production farms in the, in the region at the time. There's about 3.5 to four acres per cow. That's enough for her summer grazing and also her winter feed. Uh, all the cows are maintained in herds of 250 to 350 cows in a herd, and there's usually 12 to 18 herds on a farm. So again, very structured. Just another shot on, on uh, kind of taking the late, very late summer, early fall, some cows grazing. Here's another shot on some bragging a farm, kind of around that uh, late July uh, time period. Uh, Plenty of feed, you noticed. Um, most all the grass is improved grasses. Uh, the land originally was uh, controlled by uh, the collective farm system. And when the Soviet Union broke up, uh, all, the, 
all the land was owned by the state was uh, reverted to the collective farms to assign ownership and disperse it. And that was, of course, in 1991. Um, and it was dispersed to the people that worked on the collective farm according to their seniority and the number of years they worked there and a, and a specific uh, job that they had. But they received undivided interest. They didn't see receive specific acreages. And of course, in many cases, nobody had any money. So even though they were assigned the ownership of an undivided interest, they couldn't do anything with it. And so much of the land sat idle for since 1991, some of it even longer than that. In fact, when I went out and you look at it, it looked like CRP land that hadn't been taken care of. Some of it would be encroachment with trees, shrubs, some of it just kind of the native grasses that came back. But if you drive across it, you'd think it'd be a native pasture. Well, there's actually plow furrows there left from 1991. So it was kind of rough. So anyway, uh, there's land agents that represent these undivided interests and our land team goes in and negotiates the purchase of it and see so we would purchase basically the uh, oh I'll say anywhere from three to five collective farms and put them into an operational unit to create one of our farms uh, but the but then we'd seed the grass with improved grass species uh, we had a grass mixture we uh, put together a fescue orchard grass timothy ryegrass festulolium small and larger flat clover in the beginning it was uh Quite easy to do but as we were expanding and later we began on their pyramid scheme to add 20 farms a year well that's almost 300,000 acres we put out an order for improved grass seed uh, to our to our suppliers and uh, the suppliers were you know western western Europe but also Willamette Valley of Oregon and also New Zealand and we soon found out that our order was larger than the annual production of of grass seed of those particular species so that motivated us to actually go back and decide when well, we need to have our own grass seed production. And so we bought some parent lines and have developed our own grass seed production. And now at 3 million acres, we actually uh, annually uh, reseed about, the goal is to reseed 10% of that of the pasture land every year. So we're gonna be reseeding almost 300,000 acres of grass seed every year. Corn, uh, we do also raise alfalfa, and a lot of times that's mixed with the uh, with the improved grasses. Uh, we have corn, uh, and again, it's corn silage, high moisture corn, earlage, and uh, dry, dry grain. Uh, you'll see mo most all the equipment is uh, from Europe or from uh, the United States. Uh, we do a lot of chopping uh, because there's a lot of rainfall in the summer part of the year, a lot of showers. We do put up a little dry hay, but it's hard to actually get it cured out. And uh, so we chop, put up a lot of haylage and silages. This is just shot of replacement heifer farms. There's eight to 12,000 heifers on each farm. Uh, there'll be 90,000 heifers will actually be synchronized and AI'd this year. Uh, we usually put on, a, it's real simple, we put on a 700 pound minimum limit on the heifer. And uh, the targets to have the heifers weighing about 770 pounds when we actually uh, inseminate them. We use both the seven day and 14 day uh, cedar fixed time AI. We have 400 he heifers in a group, uh, four groups per day. We have synchronized them. So there's one at seven, 10, one o'clock and four o'clock in the afternoon. So there's 1600 heifers inseminated on, on the farm. And we usually do three farms simultaneously. So we're doing 4,800 inseminations a day and do that over uh, 17 to 21 days. We've actually had a number of uh, uh, inseminators come from the US in the early days to actually help us and give us some uh, assistance in that area. And it actually works uh, pretty effectively. We put uh, two largest AI barns on either side of that double alley, right where it actually turns into the single alley. And then we also use the silence of shoot. So potentially you could use five inseminators uh, at, a, at a time on one farm. We usually get away with three inseminators, but it actually works uh, very, very efficiently. We also have the wean, wean steer farms. They range from eight to 18,000 head per farm. The calves are weaned on the cow calf farms and then they're gradually moved to the, uh, the steer farms. They'll come in weighing anywhere from 300 to 550 pounds, and the, and the growth is 770 pounds. Our calving season basically begins kind of late April, 
and finishes sometime in August. Most of the calves are born in May and June. So the real challenge you have is you've got 80% of your calves born in a two month period, but how do you distribute that supply going over to the feed plant and uh, or, uh, feed feed lots and then also to the to plant so you have consistent products so that's a real challenge you got to set up different growth rates and uh, on different rations to actually achieve those goals this is a photo of uh, taking a uh, kind of feedlot one uh, we noticed the poultry plant we're just we're about a kilometer away from the poultry plant and also the beef plant so the the cattle from this particular feedlot actually walked to the plant uh, again, the plant will uh, harvest uh, about 10,000 a week or has the capacity to do that. And the poultry plant's doing 12,000 an hour. I tried to get my wife to go into the defeathering uh, room in that plant to see how it all worked out for her, but she wouldn't, she wouldn't cooperate with me there. Notice the feedlot is, is, has, uh, is kind of the Canadian design uh, where we have uh, windbreaks in between the pins. Uh, we've got about a 3% slope in the pen in this particular feedlot. Uh, the feedlot pens are all the same size, and there's about always 300 head in each, real close to 300 head in each pen. Uh, with in pen variation, there's 20 kilograms from the heaviest steer when they go on feed to the, to the lightest steer. So 44 pounds from the top to the bottom when the feeding period begins. We've got this sorting system set up there so we can set uh, receive cattle here in diagonal pens and then resort them however we need to. And once they go in the pen, they stay in that pen until it's their date for harvest. Once they arrive in that pen, you know what the harvest date is. It's already set. Uh, so they go on the feeding plan. It's basically high moisture corn, corn silage diet with sunflower cake. We also have a mineral package. It's about 2% uh, of the uh, as fed ration it includes menensin and urea. There's 250 foot uh, per head uh, space in this uh, feedlot. It's a dirt feedlot and 12 inches of bunk space. This contracts with the with the feet second or the third feedlot we built, which is a slatted floor confinement feedlot facility. Uh, we get big mud seasons both in the fall and in the spring. And we actually did kind of a pilot project where we built. Uh, uh, facility and tested it and the performance and efficiency in that uh, confinement facility outperformed the dirt lots eight months out of the year. So anyway, we up and uh, decided to build a facility. The uh, barns are actually 50 feet by, they're just over a kilometer in length, 3,400 feet in length. They're a monoslope, uh, 24 square feet per animal. There's about 7,000 steers in every barn. We've got 14 barns, so at that facility, about 90,000 or 98,000 head of cattle. Uh, they're actually aligned directly east and west. And so during the summer, the sun basically just hits right in front of the feed bunk, the peak of the summer and the winter, then it penetrates deep into the back of the back of the facility. Uh, notice we have the curtain at the back uh, to help try to control some ventilation. Uh, it's a very comfortable in the facility. It may, even though the temperature outside may easily be minus 20, it, it, it may be just barely below freezing inside that facility. And of course, in the summer, it's, it's really very pleasant because the cattle are completely shaded. We also have a Wagyu project where we've got, uh, we're not there yet, but we're close where we're gonna have 30,000 uh, F1 Wagyu by Angus cows. We just breed uh, Wagyu to uh, Angus heifers and create the F1 female and we're going to have 30,000 of those we're going to uh, then turn mate those back to to wagyu so i have a three quarter uh three quarter wagyu that will actually put on feed for four to four to five hundred days and uh, harvest about 17 to 1800 pounds uh the goal is to have 100 animals a day uh or about 500 a week when we're killing uh our bigger numbers of Angus cattle, cold dairy cows, and rose veal will also have a kind of a premium product of, of Wagyu that we can merchandise. We started again in 2011. We sourced 65,000 commercial Angus heifers from the U.S., 60,000 from Australia, uh, about 7,000 registered Angus bulls from, from the U.S., and about 1,500 registered Angus bulls from Australia. So we started with a base of 120. 5,000 commercial Angus heifers, 
all the semen that was used in our insemination of our heifers came from the U.S. Uh, we also imported about 500 quarter horses. All the cattle on the on the ranches are uh, are handled by uh, horseback. And this is a picture actually I, I suggested once we got started that we ought to have a rodeo to try to promote the uh, to try to promote the camaraderie and also acknowledge the skills of the people out there actually. Uh, taking care of the cattle on a day-by-day -day basis and so it's set up as a ranch type rodeo uh, where uh, farms are actually uh, arranged in a district so there'll be six to eight farms in a district and every district ends up having a team so there's I don't know how many teams there are now but there were about oh, 12 to 14 teams when I was there uh, two years ago and uh, so they compete on various events uh, but the Russians, they blew everything up uh, to where it's got to be uh, more fantastic than what's done in the U.S. They have skydivers. We actually have a rock concert after the rodeo. Not a rodeo dance, but a rock concert. And we also have cheerleaders during the events, which is also kind of an added touch. So the, the heifers were, were, most of them were sourced from the northwestern part of the U.S. And, it was, and they were quarantined just south of Garden City, Kansas. And then they were exported out of Galveston. We're not really big, we're not really used to doing a lot of live at animal export in the US. I mean, not on large scale. And so it really presented a lot of challenges. On average, it was a thousand miles from where these heifers were sourced to where Garden City was. And then from Garden City to the port, it's 800 miles. And Tony Clayton was mentioned about how, what demerge feeds can be if you don't uh, don't have all your stock there on time, they don't pass inspections. They got to individually uh, inspect every animal and uh, re scan every animal. And what if you got an ice storm in, in uh, kind of south in Oklahoma or, or North Texas? There, you got a problem. You got at least 80, 80 semis on the road, and they got to be there by seven o'clock the next morning. So it's a it's a it was a big challenge. Uh, we did we did several we did. Once uh, ship, a lot of times we do back-to-back -back shipments of about 4,000 heifers on every shipment. And the uh, biggest shipment we did out of the U.S. was, uh, I think it was just shy of 11,000 uh, heifers on one shipment. We also ship horses there too. That, that creates its own challenge as well. On Australia, it's much different. They've been doing a lot of live Atlanta sport, a lot more than what the U.S. has for a long, long time. You can set up, you can see there, one of, this is one of the, uh, quarantine facilities pictured there it's right near the coast right near where the cattle are loaded um, and it's a very simple situation a lot of times they'll just go out and feed oat and hay uh, on the ground for these cattle so their system is much more simpler than what uh, ours is uh, the most of the cattle are sourced out of uh, new south wales victoria and south australia average haul for them was maybe only 150 miles from the, from where the cattle are sourced to where they actually quarantine uh and and then the, within the port the cattle uh m many times they were quarantined well one facility is within five miles of the port another facility is maybe 20 another and maybe all oh, 30 or 40 so the actual you can do round trips with trucks and 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 control your time and loading the vessel much easier than what we can in the u.s so this is obviously supposed to be a picture of of europe and uh, the Australian voyages would be about 30 days across the uh, Indian Ocean, come up through the uh, Red Sea, through the Suez Canal, Mediterranean, Bostra Strait, into the Black Sea, and the port of Nova Sisk. Uh, the uh, shipments out of the U.S. would take 18 to 21 days. You'd head out of Galveston, go to the Azores, and, and during the uh, warmer time of the months, you'd go uh, right up through the English Channel through the Kiel Canal that cuts off Denmark into the uh, Baltic Sea and into the port of Vosluga, which is right near St. Petersburg. Uh, if, if the Baltic Sea was frozen over, then you'd go through the Mediterranean Sea and proceed to Nova Sisk. Uh, but you got to plan how much, how much fodder, how much feed you're going to put on it. You don't want to rest short. You don't want to have too much. Uh, so anyway, that's the issue. The places where the stars are, that's where, that's where our, uh, that's, that's where our primary locations are. You know, that's right border the Ukraine, Ukraine and Belarusia. We had farms where the, where the fence line was right on the Ukrainian border. 
And, and when I first arrived there, that wasn't a big issue. But obviously, it's a big issue now. And notice that this, uh, this little enclave over here to the west, you hear a lot about that now. That's Kaliningrad. That's a territory that was actually controlled by Germany up to the World War II. And the Soviets claimed that territory after World War II. And so now it's a, an important military installation for Russia. Uh, and we actually have six farms there uh, with cow-calf farms. And we also have a, a cooked meals ready to eat type of plant there as well. Uh, so anyway, we're, we're very close to the current action. Uh, and also from the port to where the farms are, it's about a 900 mile haul, uh, either from, or Oslug, it's about 600 mile haul. But that's not the whole story. The, the first shipments that came in, uh, the trucks averaged 40 hours on the road delivering the heifers. And the last truck came or took the longest was 80 hours. We lost three heifers on that, on that shipment. Uh, and you wouldn't think cattle could endure that because uh, they weren't offloaded or feeding water, but the roads are much rougher. And the, the, we, don't we didn't have very many cattle trucks. A lot of them were uh, loaded into trucks that we more no typically use for hauling grain. And then they just have boards that would slide into the back to hold the cattle into the, into the truck. There'd be 14 trucks in the front and then they'd pull a pup with 14 or 14 heifers in the back. So uh, it's amazing what cattle are actually able to do and, uh, and withstand. But once they'd get there, they'd actually drink and eat a little, but they'd basically just rest for about three days before they were uh, what you'd call back to normal. This is a more close up of the branch region where the, where the headquarters of the uh, operation really lies. Uh, Chernobyl is about, well, let's see if I can get it down here, right here. And that's one reason this, this region was closed for 25 years for anybody to go in and do anything with. And when we arrived there, there's maybe 5% of that whole region, region obelisk, that's a state, uh, was any kind of uh, production at all. And today you go in there and I'll say more than 95% of all that land is productive. So it's great to see. So you all of a sudden you see land that goes from non-production. You can imagine what does to local economy and tax base where it's 95% production. There's been just a complete evolution of everything in that region and everybody's life in that region. The green stars basically represent farms and they're in that region. We actually have more farms and I've got stars there and the red farms are, are, are the backgrounding farms. And then you've got the plant centrally located there right here and then you have feedlot one, you got feedlot three down here, you got feedlot two over here. And you can see that basically there's not long distances from the farms to the backgrounding farms. They're all with easily within an hour's drive. And the, and the plant, the feedlot to the plant is two hours drive. So anyway, we, we don't have any cattle arrive in the middle of the night or, and there's no stress on the cattle. There's no reason to ship cattle are under stress or anything. You wait till the right time. The cattle always arrive during the day. Uh, one thing is we do buy domestic cattle in Altai and that's 3000 miles away. And that's probably, that's a week's transport. And I've never got, been able to get the answer if they're ever offloaded and uh, for rest and reloaded. Uh, they never share that information with me. Uh, comparison to the Australian heifers and US heifers, I would say, and this is information kind of from about 10 years ago when we actually bought the cattle. Uh, I'd say they're finer bone, they're small, they were smaller cattle. Uh, typically the mature size on those cattle would probably be 1100 to 1200 pounds versus the, most of the heifers we're buying were at least 1250 pounds mature weight, if not 1350 and probably some of them a lot bigger than that. But the Australian heifers were very easy uh, fleshing heifers and they adapted. Uh, extremely well to the to environment in Russia, even though none of them, or I'll say none of them, hardly any of them had ever seen water freeze before. So this, this photo down here is the first shipment that came in. We actually got 6,000 heifers out of Australia. They arrived June 2nd. It was, uh, it would have been coming into the Australian winter. Uh, and so they had long hair when they arrived but they're arriving in a different photo period and arriving in, in Russia when it's 
Russian summer. Russian summer is not hot. It's typically kind of the hottest temperature is kind of middle eighties. Uh, but nonetheless, most, most nutritionists would tell you that, that, that they've got a copper deficiency. Well, they didn't have a copper deficiency. It's just dead hair that hadn't actually shed off. But those same heifers, January 15th, following year, there they are. They're standing there. They're completely black, all shed out, got a new hair growth. And uh, it's minus 30 there. It was, it was minus 25 to minus 30 all the way through January and February there. We don't keep them inside. We actually bed them, provide portable windbreaks for them. We have good corn, you know, corn silage, high forage diet. That's uh, very well, but it's amazing. They, they still kept their, uh, their ability to acclimate from the old world, Scotland, from several, from a century or so before. We also import a lot of feeder steers from Australia. Usually, uh, it was four or five years, we imported 50,000 feeder steers from Australia every year. Um, about 75 to 80 percent of them were Angus. The balance would have been the English cross cattle. You'll find some pretty good shorthorn cattle there as well, uh, coming in with an average weight of 775 pounds. We shipped, uh, the biggest shipment we shipped was 22,000 head. I can never imagine being able to do that and put that many on a vessel, but we did that. Uh, seemed to work fine. The real story here is kind of interesting is they arrived somewhere between December 1st and May 1st. Many of them were around December, January, February, March. I mean, it is cold. It's not, you don't have any Chinooks, you don't have any warm ups. It's cold. The warmest temperature you'll ever see in that time period may be zero degrees Fahrenheit. But for the most part, it's going to be minus 10, minus 20, you know, maybe occasionally minus 30, but it's cold. And so you've got cattle that are completely acclimated to summer, have absolutely no hair. Metabolically, they're ready for summer. And, and they come across the Indian Ocean, enter the Suez Canal. It's really hot. Go on the Mediterranean, start to get a little cooler temperatures in the Black Sea, but you really don't have any cool weather coming until you start north out of the port of Novosisk. And so they arrive on our farms, and all of a sudden, they're, it's like putting in a, taking somebody from the summer without any coat and putting them in a chill freezer at, at minus 20. And so anyway, we end up bedding these cattle in uh, straw that would be about three feet deep. And of course we had our, our high quality uh, ration on feed, but they weren't really used to eating uh, fermented feeds, but that's what we gave them. Uh, they learned real quick. And uh, anyway, they dive into that, into that uh, straw and line up like sausages, like pigs will do when it's really cold. And uh, they adapted or acclimated, I should say, over time. And, and they, they run out, eat, and then they drive right back into that straw. And uh, it would take them about six weeks to fully acclimate it. After about three weeks, you'd see them start to grow just a little bit of fuzz, really dense fuzz on their, on their surface. And then by six weeks, they were fully acclimated and there wasn't any problem. But it was amazing how they, much they'd eat. We actually did some calculations, at least on one group, and uh, we figured out that they were actually eating 3.65% of their body weight on a dry matter basis. So they were inhaling just a huge amount of dry matter just to try to offset the, the cold. Uh, death loss wouldn't be as extreme as what you want to do. I lobbied and lobbied and lobbied and tried to prevent them from bringing cattle in that time of the year, but they didn't listen to me. The worst we ever did was 3.5% death loss the first 45 days after arrival. Uh, and typically we'd be somewhere around one and a half to two percent. Uh, so it's, those cattle actually marble very well. Uh, the only comparison I directly have, or I normally have a direct comparison, but it's interesting because we have our our cattle are actually produced domestically. That the the females actually originated in Australia or the U.S. And then we have the Australian steers that we imported. Well, our domestic cattle that would actually outperform the Australian steers that were actually directly imported. But of course. If we're making any genetic progress, they should. But our best cattle actually came out of Kaliningrad, and the Russians couldn't understand that because we had it, it's an enclave over there where the managers over there kind of went rogue, and so we had a lot of a lot of managing problems with them. And but when we put them in the feedlot, this cattle outperformed. I said, well, that's easy to explain because the source on those heifers, there was about twenty thousand of them. Uh, half of them were bought in a diamond ring sale up in Montana. And the other were pretty good source heifers as well. But all the bulls that actually went to that enclave came out of Gardner Angus Ranch. And of course, at Gardner Angus Ranch would have had 
on average uh, higher performing bulls than the average bulls that we bought. So, I mean, that was the explanation. So, I mean, just another testament that uh, EPDs do do work. This is this is uh, just some of the steers being sourced out of Australia at a uh, at a uh, quarantine facility there, where we sorted uh, RFID them and inspect them before they go on the vessel. This is one of the vessels. There's 15,000 steers on this vessel. Uh, when it goes into port, it's the biggest vessel there. Uh, the only thing would be bigger, it'd probably be a, a, a like an aircraft carrier. Uh, but uh, so this is in Fremantle, Western Australia. Uh, there's a, there's also 150 low truck loads of feed that has to go on that vessel. So I mean, it's a huge effort just to get the vessel equipped and ready to go. Typical death loss on one of those shipments is 0.2 percent. It's actually lower than if the animals had stayed at home. I mean, they go through such testing and such uh, vaccination program at, at uh, you know, in the quarantine facility that, and they're really cared for. So we had sourced the uh, nucleus herd for our uh, Angus project, came from four different sources. There were three from the US, Thomas Angus Ranch, TC Ranch, Ganeli Angus Ranch, and then also from Lawson Angus, Australia, Harry Lawson was here. So, He's very familiar with this project and was a great help to us. All the semen that we purchased to have, have to develop our and continue our nucleus herd was out of the U.S. We usually purchase semen from six to ten sires, but we were also purchasing large amounts of semen to actually use on the commercial Angus heifers at the same same time. Our spe specifications are actually pretty simple. The, the bulls had to be registered with the American Angus Association or Australian Angus Society. We set EPD limits where they had to be in the 50th percentile or better for CED, birth weight, yearling weight, marbling, and our uh, ribeye area. They're 12 to 16 months of age, 32 centimeter testicles, structurally sound. If there's any uh, bulls that acted up when I inspected them, we threw them out. And Australian, they typically develop bulls uh, much slower than what we do in the U.S. They don't hard feed them. And so I had a minimum uh, there. They had to have a kilogram per day of age for uh, plus their birth weight for the Australian bulls. And, and most of them all would meet it without any trouble. We probably had 40 different suppliers of bulls from the U.S. And, and we had more than six, but basically six, six suppliers in Australia uh, became our primary suppliers of bulls. Uh, I'd say the Australian bulls, they have better feet. They've spent a lot more time uh, and concern with, uh, with feet and structural problems in, in Australian cattle. Uh, so they have better feet. They're developed more slowly, which is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Their the yearling weights would typically be 450 to 500 kilos, uh, but they still have the genetic, genetic ability to perform. They're just developed more slowly. Easy fleshing adapted very well in the real, uh, the EPDs uh, or breeding values that we had out of them, I found them to be very reliable. Here's some of the current metrics on uh, on the project. Uh, here we're calving out. Well, first step it was 6,000 heifers, but then we rapidly grow where we're calving out 60,000 heifers a year. In the very beginning, you're working with people that have absolutely no experience whatsoever. Remember that agriculture collapsed for a whole generation. So they didn't have any experience. They didn't even know what a damn cow was other than a milk cow. They didn't know how to ride a horse, how to do anything, how to move cattle. And so we were, you have to solve problems. And one of the reasons you, well, you can do it, you pick the right time of the year and you, and you pick the right, the right bulls and, you, and feed cattle properly. But we performed a lot better than I thought we would. Our dystocia was, was less than 1% in our, even in our heifers. And... Uh, uh, the, the, that's the good news. The bad news, if we had a dissociate problem, uh, the calf was dead essentially 90% of the time and the cow was dead half the time. So you want to solve those problems as much as you can. The other thing that's really a stick out, these, these death loss rates are probably, you know, typical for a well-managed U.S. operation, but the one in the feedlot is 0 0.5 to 0.7%. That's only about half of what the death loss rate would be in the typical U.S. feedlot. But again, we don't mix cattle from other people as a rule, and the cattle are never stressed, and we have a very strict uh, vaccination program. Uh, so that uh, the uh, conception rates are kind of 
I'd say pretty much in line with what you'd, what you'd like to see here in the US. You'd always like to see better. Feedlot gains, remember we don't use, uh, we don't use growth implants. We don't use repartitioning agents. Uh, so they're basically, and we feed the cattle to very heavy weights. Uh, notice down here, yield grade 4.8, it's too heavy. Uh, but feed is cheap in, Ru in Russia. It's about a third cheaper than what it is in the US. The only thing I can figure out why that is, is because it's what they allot the cost of production to the land cost. In the US, the cost of producing grain, about half of it is the cost of the land, or a third to the half is the cost of the land. But in Russia, land is cheaper. And so the cost of grain is, at least the way these economics, are, our economists figured it out. But prime, we were getting 50 to 70% prime on our cattle. Again, with no implants and taking those heavier weights. And that has a great value to our to our customers. Uh, one thing about goes back to our objectivity within our owners and whatnot. We set very specific targets for our production herds, what we needed to achieve in the next 20 years, where we were, where we needed to be. We did this for carcass value, feed efficiency, fertility, longevity, serving capacity, and also immune resilience. Uh, so you go back and you look at the uh, equation. Uh, Richard Burton published way back in, in 1999. Maybe there's people that published before him where uh, the delta, the rate of genetic change is a function of accuracy, intensity of selection, standard deviation of the trait, and general generation uh, interval. We created these huge spreadsheets where we actually looked at uh, uh, these different traits that we thought were economically important and different systems of where we could actually produce bulls and how, how quickly could we get to those targets? We looked at using genomics versus no genomics. We looked at AI only versus AI plus IVF in the nucleus herd, eventual semen and also sex semen and, the, and a strategy where we had a multiplier herd versus where we didn't have a multiplier herd where all the bulls for the production herd were actually produced directly from the, uh, from the nucleus herd. Uh, we also looked at crossbreeding or discussed prodding, and I get always get this question, uh, and it always comes down to which breed and which traits. If you look at maternal traits, you're concerned about calf viability, birth weaning, fertility, longevity, and we really don't have very good EPDs for any one of those. But I actually took a pool of what I would say maternal Angus bulls would be, and also a pool of Simitol. Uh, bulls that would be very maternally uh, strong maternal traits and also a pool of Hereford bulls and then I took those the average of those EPs and applied the uh, crossbreed EPDs uh, created by USDA uh, Mean Animal Research Center and at least what that tells you with is if you actually use those pool, pool of bulls you'd actually increase at least on the scimitols the scimitol would increase birth weight quite a bit you really wouldn't lose much in weaning weight, but weaning weight's not really important to our project. Yearling weight and carcass weight is, and you'd be sacrificing quite a bit of marbling. You get more ribeye, but there again, ribeye's okay, but it's not that important in our carcass value. And uh, Herefords, uh, you'd be giving up a lot. Uh, we also looked at terminal traits, morbidity, mortality is important, feed efficiency be important, carcass value important. Again, I took a pool of five or six good Charlay bulls that would be good terminally to use in our project and look at uh, Charlay limousine and some terminal bulls from sorry lay breed you're going to have substantially more birth weight but but it's amazing if you do the selection within the Angus breed you can get some bulls that can really grow and and uh, so anyway when you get right down to it look over here at carcass value you get them up a lot of carcass weight you get them up a lot of marbling and that's really important in at least on our project. Now, this is just on paper. So I think we, we I've actually proposed some, uh, some crossbreeding experiments and we've actually got Hereford semen uh, from a Hereford bull in there now where we're trying to create some black, black baldies, but those, those experiments take a long time to find out what's actually would be the right strategy for us to use in our project. But uh, right now, uh, it's, just a, it's just a small experiment. This is kind of comparing the two strategies for uh, producing bulls for the Angus or, or for our production herd. This, oops, this one has a nucleus herd, which you have real intensive AI, so maybe some embryo transfer, but you also have a, 
a multiplier herd of about 16,000 cows where you're actually doing everything in natural service. So it's real simple. You don't have a lot of management problems. You produce about 8,000 bulls out of there and you select 4,000 of them become your replacement bulls to go on a production herd. You compare that with a system over here where you've got intent, uh, a nucleus herd of about 1,200 cows, but you separate them into terminal cow or essentially terminal herd and a maternal herd. So they'll actually have high traits for terminal traits or maternal traits. And you do intensive IVF and AI on those. You're producing 2,000 bulls out of the terminal of cows to go on the production herd. And then you're producing about 2,000 bulls plus 20 AI sires to actually be used on the, on the production herd. And when we actually did this, uh, showed out real quickly, at least on paper, that uh, we could not, with using the multiplier herd strategy, uh, we could not meet our objectives on many of our traits. Some of them were taken uh, 50 years. There was even one trait that was taken 99 years to meet our objectives. Whereas if we actually use the strategy on the right with the intensive uh, selection within the nucleus herd and using IVF, we could achieve all our uh, genetic targets that we wanted to within 20 year period. So obviously, we chose, we chose that structure. So we have 400,000, or we will have 400,000 cows by the end of the year, we have 360,000. We've got 90,000 heifers that are being AI'd this year. We actually end up having 50 terminal farms, 50 maternal farms. All the offspring from the terminal farms go to the, plant, go to the feedlot and the plant. The maternal farms, they generate replacement heifers, both for the terminal farms and also the maternal farms. Those that are animals of coal went in to go and feed the plant. <clears throat> so why do we have so much great emphasis on genetic progress and a vertically integrated enterprise? Uh, genetic control, it's the only way you can ensure predictability, consistency, and quality uh, for your customers. Uh, the owners actually kind of learned this in the pig project. They start out with PIC pigs, and then uh, I don't know, a few years into the project, decided well, they could save a little money, and so they decide they could do it do it their own, just select their own pigs on their own system. And they soon found out it didn't work. And so anyway, uh, they, they have that experience and that, that's also, I didn't have to fight that battle. They were believers in, in genetic control and genetic progress and been very strong performers of that. Another big benefit of our project, if there's any benefit to be captured from a, gained from a genetic progress, we're gonna capture that dollar value in our system. It's not going to get away from it. It's much kind of much different in most of the U.S. where you've got bull producers are selling maybe a highly efficient bulls to cow-calf producers who are selling their calves to the feedlot owner. Well, the feedlot owner is probably the one benefiting from the feed efficiency. It's not the it's not the person making the genetic progress in the very initial bit uh, to capture that. He's got to sell the idea. And whereas in us, if there's genetic progress and, and money to be made, we're going to make it. Once our genetic engine is going, we believe we can add $6 million a year to our bottom line. And it's, uh, it's not there yet, but I'd say within the next couple of years, it's gonna be well on its way. That's adding $15 per cow unit per year or $300 per cow unit to our 20 years of progress. So once it gets going the first year, we're gaining 6 million, the next year, 12, 18, just keeps you on and going. So 20 years we expect uh, they had $120 million to the bottom line. That's real money in a project that's uh, about a about billion dollars a year, uh, annual sales. So we'd be getting, we'd be increasing it by 10% just for genetic progress. Every calf is uh, RFID at two or three months of age when it's first uh, vaccinated. And we estimate the birth date at that point. Basically, we're, we're vaccinating in June. We say, well, that's an April calf or that's May calf. Every calf is genotyped with Lunuma 50K chip. That's pretty unusual. So we're doing over 300,000 uh, cattle in our database with a 50K chip. And after that, after that animal is uh, RFID'd, then every weight, all vaccination, treatment, pregnancies, breeding sound exam, reasons for culling, cause of deaths, that's all recorded in our database. So an excellent platform for genetic evaluation selection, very potential to actually identify embryonic bort, uh, lethals or other genetic recessives. Back when DD broke loose, 
uh, there are a lot of people in the U.S. that said, well, I've never seen one of those. Well, just in our herd, I saw at least 32, I'm pretty sure, were DD uh, carriers. We have so many animals that it, it's pretty obvious when something goes wrong, when it's always reported. And so you really uh, you have a large pool to actually look at. Uh, also an exit platform to look at fertility, stability, longevity of females, serving capacity and longevity of bulls, serving capacities, because we can identify the sire of every calf born there. So we know which bulls are actually siring zero to five calves. And we put 10 in, about 10 bulls in with 300 cows in a, in a herd. So you know which bulls are actually doing the job and which are maybe siring 75. Yeah, so we expect to try to make some progress there. And immune resi resilience, uh, we have 30,000 deaths in a project a year. So that's a lot of data that we have a supposedly cause of death and time of death, weight of the animal and information we could actually evaluate. We have our own black, uh, bull collection facility. We house 40 bulls and uh, we work with ST genetics and we have uh, sex sorting capability. We have our own IVF laboratory. It's produced uh, 30,000 embryos uh, and also implanted a year. Um, we, we were producing about 400 embryos a day uh, during the embryo production season. Uh, do OPUs on 80 to 100 donors, <laughs> cycle them every two weeks, uh, and then set up uh, 500 recipients on synchronization and 400 hopefully will be qualified for replace or for embryo implantation. <coughs> we have our own genetics or genomics laboratory in Moscow that does uh, up to 500,000 samples a year. We also do 78,000 pigs a year, and we also do the sheep as well. We have a growth safe system that has the potential to, to uh, test five to 6,000 animals per year. I'll have a little bit more later. This is uh, kind of photos of, of uh, our, our nucleus herd farm, where we have this system set up at four different locations in that farm, where there's four to six pastures that come in the facilities. So you, have, you can easily uh, bring herds in, perform synch synchronization, perform AI, perform uh, OPU uh, for whatever you want to do. This is a, a picture of our uh, grow safe system that's set up uh, in one of our uh, confinement feed barns. So you have minimal, uh, minimal environmental effects. You really don't have cold stress. You don't really have heat stress. You don't have mud. Uh, we have eight bunks. Uh, or eight eight nodes per pen, 65 bulls per pen, or you can do 80 to, uh, 80 uh, heifers or steers per pen, and we do 49 uh, day trials. This is another key element of this. We have the in pen weighing system that I think is really important uh, to establish the the target or the uh, beginning and ending weight of these animals. Uh, but it, you know, can you justify this? Well. If you get one pound improvement in dry matter conversion, we have a million cattle on feed, uh, either cows, calves, or, or steers uh, in the feedlot, you know, for six months out of the year. If we make one, one uh, pound improvement dry matter conversion, we're gonna feed, uh, save a million pounds of feed every day, or uh, dry matter feed. Uh, that could be, turn out to be $42 million in savings annually. Uh, we focus on improving efficiency, not decent, decreasing intake. I know in some of the uh, indexes in the Angus Association, they actually put a negative impact on or having high intakes is actually negative. We don't necessarily do that. What we do is we, we want to select for RFI or true efficiency. We're also selecting for post reading gain at the same time. And we kind of let intake go wherever it, wherever it needs to go. Uh, we've done PC analysis on the SNPs on our, uh, or our, our nucleus herd. We find basically three different pools within that nucleus herd and have uh, identified different lines essentially within that nucleus herd. Therefore, we actually develop a terminal line using that, that SNP analysis and also their ranking in the terminal and maternal index indexes. And then we actually have four maternal lines that we've assigned to. Within the terminal line, you, you're trying to produce 2,000 replacement bulls a year to go on the terminal cows. And we will actually, obviously, the, keep the top indexing females and optexing bulls within that terminal line to, to reproduce and keep the terminal line going. But we will purchase outside semen 
to also interject additional uh, outside germplasm into that line. Uh, rank, or, uh, matings are based on SNP evaluation to avoid inbreeding, not based on pedigree. So we look at SNPs a lot. Same thing with maternal, uh, four maternal lines. Each line produce 500 replacement bulls a year. Uh, their selection criteria is identical within that line. The top indexing heifers and sires are actually maintained in the line. Again, we will bring in outside semen to try to uh, uh, improve that line and keep that line going. And the, the strategy for crossing these maternal lines is no different than if you were doing a uh, four breed rotational crossbreeding program. Line one bulls go on A farms, line two bulls, bulls always go on B farms, line three on C maternal farms, and line four on D maternal farms. And then the, the heifer farm or the heifers from A always go to B, B to C, and C to D. So it's, it's pretty structured. And in uh, terminal production farms, they get they get replacement heifers from all the all the different farms, but they have to be high ranking or the highest ranking ones on the uh, maternal index. And of course, we use uh, phenotypic data, pedigree data, genotypes, all that in the single step methodology to make our uh, genetic uh, merit estimates and our selection decisions. And in our terminal index, carcass value is really heavily weighted. Uh, and that's basically carcass weight and marbling efficiencies, also heavily weighted, post weaning gain and residual feed intake, longevity, serving capacity, and uh, morbidity and mortality is all components of that. Maternal index is heavily weighted on fertility. We have uh, phenotypic data on heifer pregnancy, a lot of that, on first calf heifer pregnancy, and also on cow pregnancy. In some cases, uh, some of our vet are, are qualified enough that they actually can distinguish between the first, second, and third cycle uh, pregnancy, and we try to use that information as well. Longevity is, is important also. Feed efficiency is a component of that. And I guess what we've learned from the project so far, uh, it's amazing how resilient cattle actually are. If you feed them and take care of them, uh, they're extremely resilient to treat the cold temperature challenges, probably more so than, than hot temperature challenges. Uh, genomic EPDs are extremely reliable based on what we were able to do with calving ease, uh, the grading of the cattle, the performance of the cattle. Technologies uh, that we've implemented, successfully implemented on a very large scale, like our AI project, also an embryo project. Um, investment genetic college have an excellent payback. That's why we invested heavily in uh, in the gross age system, invested in the genomics laboratory and the IVF laboratory. Um, and I think it, it hasn't proven yet, but I think it's gonna prove out. And then there's lots of opportunity uh, to, to make improvement in fertility, feed efficiency, longevity or stability, serving capacity, immune resilience and response is a big one, I think, and also in embryonic lethals. And uh, I'd like to thank, and th these are a number of people that actually have been very supportive uh, of the project over the years. This is actually when I was crossing the bridge going to the uh, corporate uh, office, which is about, uh, it'd be about a mile away from uh, the Kremlin. So it's kind of uh, kind of strange for an American to be in that kind of a environment, but uh, there it was. Thank you.